welcome to the Sherrod Podcast. I'm Cassie. And I'm Lisa. And today we are with the one and the only, the most requested person for the podcast, Miss Lily Singh. <gasps> yeah. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Um, for those of you guys who don't know who Lily Singh is, like, hello, get off uh, no, like, <laughs> from under your rock. No, like, what are you fair and doing? <laughs> um, Lily has over 12 and a half million subscribers on YouTube, and she is the most influential entertainer described by Forbes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> but no. thank you. You're That's welcome. You're one. welcome. Okay, so I want to start this podcast with the beginning mm -hmm. of Lily Singh, like, because I think it's a very inspirational story for people to see what resilience really means, what mm -hmm. overcoming challenges is. And so can you talk about um, the depression that you actually mm -hmm. went through that inspired the rest of your career? Sure, yeah. So I was in my last year of university, still mm -hmm. living in Toronto, getting my degree in psychology. Mm -hmm. And the decision to get a psychology degree didn't come from a place of passion at all. It was just like, okay, I need to decide something because I'm being pressured to major in something. And I, my sister did this, so I guess I'll do this. And so I was in school for four years doing something I didn't like, mm. um, really just kind of doing everything I was doing for other people, whether it was to make my parents proud or whether it was to, you know, just make sure that people in my class and my group assignments were happy or just, just mm -hmm. kind of going through the motions of life. Um, and it was my last year of university where just a bunch of things were happening. You know, I was so fed up with school. I was terrified about what was going to happen after graduating, mm -hmm. you know, just this idea that you're gonna graduate and suddenly have it figured out and get a career and being South Asian, it's like, you're gonna eventually get married very soon and then have a kid, you know? Right. Just this linear path of living. Um, I also had a falling out with a lot of my friends in my last year of university and so- Why just, that? Just for different reasons. I mean, I had a lot of uh, friends do a lot of dishonest things to me oh. in my last year of university. It was just a time where so many things that I probably could have dealt with individually happened at the same time. Oof. And so I kind of went tumbling down this dark hole for a long, long time. It was around a year of being depressed where I honestly, you wouldn't even be able to identify me as the same person I am now. Mm. I really had no desire to wake up. I had no appetite, which is a really big sign of me <laughs> not being myself. Um, and I had no goals. You know, as someone who was a young girl that always wanted to start a new project and have a new hobby and be successful to just for a year feel like I don't really care what happens tomorrow. I don't care where I end up and I don't care what my job is. It was really, really tough huh. to live without purpose for a while. Um, and I, I, people always ask me, how did you get out of that? Mm. And I, I don't have a particular answer because mm -hmm. I feel like something inside me just switched one day, but I do mm -hmm. feel one of the things that helped was YouTube. Hmm. So during that time, I discovered a YouTube video. It was a Jenna Marbles video, actually. Mm -hmm. And I was so intrigued by this idea that someone was in their room making videos yeah. for strangers, and like that was a thing. Yeah. I was like, what is this? This is crazy. Yeah. So I, without even thinking, a couple months later, uploaded a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because I wanted to be famous. Mm -hmm. That wasn't even a thing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't because I wanted to be rich. That definitely was not a thing. Yeah. It was literally because I was like, oh, I have this thought and I want to just be creative and make a video and let's see what happens. What year was that when you first This uploaded? was in 2010. 2010. My yeah. first video was in 2009 and I can attest that there was no such thing yeah, as monetization, yeah. as becoming famous. It was just like, we want to share stuff. Exactly. You was, couldn't, you had yeah. to like apply to be a partner also. Exactly. You couldn't just like make money. No, 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 no. Exactly. No, no. So it was very, very different. Um, yeah. So it came from a very genuine place of like me just wanting to be creative. Mm. I uploaded my first video. It was horrible. It was so awkward. It was a spoken word piece uh -huh. about religion, something that doesn't even apply to me anymore <laughs> in life. Um, but one thing is that I fell in love with the process of creating again. Mm. As someone who as a young girl loved to dance and loved mm -hmm. to bake and loved to write, I was reminded what it feels like to do something because you actually enjoy doing it. Mm -hmm. And so without thinking, I posted a second one and then a third one. And that snowballed into me being like, okay, well, I'm Superwoman and I'm going to make comedy videos and let me think about this. And could this be a career? And it kind of just spiraled. And really, I would say, trying to make other people laugh yeah. helped me laugh. Essentially, I was trying oh. to make myself laugh. I was trying to make myself happy. Uh -huh. And in turn, I guess I made other people happy. So it was this beautiful harmony of me lifting other people and other people lifting me. 
That's powerful. When mm. people suffer from depression, we find a lot of time they also have anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so when you're starting a pod, oh, a pod, sorry, a YouTube channel, did you find any anxiety towards it? Or was it like because you didn't know how big it could become, you didn't really think about it? Because that's the question we get a lot mm -hmm. from our fans is, how do you get started? I'm so anxious. I'm so like in this hole mm -hmm. that just getting started brings up their anxiety. Right. I think you hit the nail on the head with that. In 2010, I didn't feel anxiety because I didn't understand the mm. scope of YouTube. Mm. I was like, I'm going to post a video. The first one, 70 people watched it. Mm -hmm. right. You know, there was no careers on YouTube. So I didn't feel the stakes were very high. Mm. I was just a girl with a hobby that was just doing this for fun. Mm -hmm. I could understand today why people would feel anxiety. It's like something on the internet now could go viral. Right. This could be the start of a career that you don't want. This could be a, a, the start of an image that you're attached to for a long time. Those things weren't really real risks, I feel, in 2010. So I never really felt a lot of anxiety. I just felt a lot of nervousness, obviously, because, you know, you're putting yourself out yeah. there. Confusion, because I was like, what is an editing? What is an editing? <laughs> what is an editing software <laughs> thing? What was your first editing software? iMovie. Mine was even worse. It was Windows Movie Maker. Actually, that is exactly what it was. Because I'm like, I didn't have a MacBook. It was Windows me Movie neither. Maker. Wasn't it terrible? It, yes. And then I upgrade. I upgraded to iMovie. Yeah, me too. And now I use Final Cut. Yeah, Final And that's Cut's about great, the extent yeah. of where I'm going here. I can't go beyond that. You guys are making me feel old. I use the Steam Beck. What? The Do you guys what? even what know what a that? steam back is? What is it? it sounds a, like a steamboat. It, it, <laughs> is, it is a gigantic machine okay. that you actually splice the film together. Oh, like physical? Oh, like physical film? Physical film. Whoa. Where you have a reel. So it's a massive machine. Like for video? Yeah. How, wait, uh, wait. That's you how old I am. record video on foot film? <laughs> no, it was, no, sorry, it was film. Okay. So you're using a film camera because videotaping back then, like, was... Uh, what year are we of talking course, back here? Then. Oh, Maybe. God, yeah, back then. <laughs> um, I'm going to give my age, but um, it, I graduated in 2000. So, like, 2000... Uh, sorry, 1998? Okay, late 90s. That's great. I can get down. Yeah. At the time of, like, remember digital cameras, you had to go... Yeah, yeah, Like the yeah. disposable ones? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But the good news is, is that once you cut the film, you're done. So it actually made you much more aware of each cut you were doing oh, yeah. because there, it was really hard to go back. Mm -hmm. So it actually was an interesting way of learning the techniques and skills of editing because now, you know, you can just press Control Z and yeah, it does. Exactly. Ah. That's intense. That is really, I would really not be intense. a success if that were the case Ooh. right now. I don't know. I think that uh, you, you challenge yourself quite a lot. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, so the screen name Superwoman, mm -hmm. you mentioned that I felt like a superwoman, so that's what I wanted. Right. So how did you pick that screen name? So I actually called myself Superwoman well before YouTube. Oh. Yeah, so growing up, there was a hip-hop song by Lil Mo featuring okay. Fabulous. It's so old, so if you're listening to this and you're like, what song? You're too young. Um, <laughs> it was a really cool hip-hop song, and I know I really liked it because my MSN messenger name oh. was Superwoman. I didn't even have an that's MSN really? messenger. Really? Yeah. AIM. Oh, my. Yeah, that's very American. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay, um, okay, yeah okay, MSN okay. messenger, I think, okay. is very ultra-Canadian. Uh -huh. um, and so I, I call myself Superwoman at MSN. So when I was thinking of a YouTube channel, you know, young, naive Lily, you know, in 2010, <laughs> And not thinking her channel would go anywhere. I'm like, oh, I'll just call myself this very copyrighted, <laughs> branded name, Superwoman. Superwoman was taken, so I did I.I. Superwoman I.I. Uh -huh. Just a for, poor, for the design yeah, on the, the side. Yeah, for the design yeah. element, okay, yeah. which is also a poor decision in terms of branding. <laughs> um, and then when I started to blow up, I was like, ooh, this could be a problem. That's Has so it funny. ever been a problem? Well, I think one of the smartest decisions I ever made was yeah. to proactively reach out to DC. Ah. So I proactively, when I realized my career was kind of taking off, I was like, uh -huh. let me tell them that I'm doing this. Uh -huh. So I actually have a deal with them where they're oh. very kind and like we have a, a cool. agreement for me to use it in certain capacities. That is really, yeah. really cool because I had always wondered. If right, that had as problem. most people do. So. Because like you have some YouTubers like, uh, I think Bethany Moda is like mm -hmm. Mac Barbie exactly. or something. Like, exactly. Uh, Mac and Barbie, we, should we reach out to both? Yeah, like, exactly. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. Huh. When you're young and you're thinking of these things, you, that doesn't occur to you. Well, I'm glad you were proactive and Thank reached out, yeah. and now there is an issue. Yes, so that's because it really could have cool. went oh. bad otherwise. And legal stuff is yeah, no, no fun. fun. But calling yourself superwoman, like, that takes, a, I think, a lot of confidence, right? To, yeah. like, kind of own it. Did you feel, like, did you call yourself, if it was before you were depressed, do you call yourself mm -hmm. superwoman? When I was, like, young, young, I'm right. talking, like, 
pre-teens I called mm. myself superwoman in elementary school um because I was always like oh I have problems at school well you're superwoman and if you have mm. problems at home well you're superwoman I always you know how you feel after you watch like a superhero movie and then drive yeah. home you're like oh, oh yeah. I'm this person yeah. like that's how I felt after listening to that song and so I, I made that the philosophy mm. for my life I was like you can get through things because you're a superhero so you use that as like a tool I to did. bring yourself kind mm. of like give yourself the strength to really exactly. go after things yeah wow okay so Continuing on with your story, you overcame the depression by making other people happy. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk- and, and learning to love oh, myself. Oh, and learning to love yeah. yourself. It, with anything, sorry, just yeah, like no, no, go. learning to love yourself, I think that's very hard for people to actually grow. Yeah, how did you do that? How did you do that? I think if there's anything I could encourage anyone in the world to do, to work hard at, if I had to pick one thing, it would be loving yourself. Mm-hmm. Because I feel like in school, they don't teach you that. Mm-hmm. In school, you learn facts and you mm-hmm. learn phys- uh, figures and you learn how to figure out problems. But the problem you never learn how to figure out is how do you learn to love yourself if you don't? Mm-hmm. And right. that is so important. It's at the core of everything we do. And in my life, when I truly started to be my own friend and be like, hey, you're worthy. And you need to talk to yourself like you love yourself. Mm-hmm. And you need to treat yourself like you love yourself. And mm-hmm. you need to treat yourself how you want other people to treat you. Mm-hmm. That's when my life really started to turn around. Mm-hmm. You know, when at the end of a really long day, you can lie in bed and talk to yourself like, all right. Today kind of sucked, mm-hmm. but dude, you're going to kill it tomorrow. You need that person in your core, and that person has to be you. Mm-hmm. you know. And that was a really tough lesson to learn because a lot of things in life can knock you down. A lot of people in life can knock you down. And when you put your value in other people and other things, it's not it's not going to be good for success. It's mm-hmm. not going to be good for your health, for your mental health, for mm-hmm. your relationships, for anything. So you are always at the core of everything you do in life, I really believe. Very cool. Okay, so now you've reached um, super success, and I love seeing you on in movies, on TV, uh, on Thank like you. what do you call it? like Ch- Chelsea lately, yeah, yeah. right? And all over the place on red carpets. How do you feel about all of the su- success that you have? Because I remember reading uh, one of your Instagram posts that really mm-hmm. touched me. You mentioned how we shouldn't feel ashamed for the success that we have because that's something that. On the daily, I'm just like, should I share this or not? Mm-hmm. Or not? Are people going to think I'm a super cocky bee? Like, right. <laughs> so how do you how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, as a really big feminist, I you know, as I mentioned in that post, I think particularly women mm-hmm. have a really hard time talking about their achievements, mm-hmm. and I think that's been drilled into us. You know, it's yeah. it's the idea that if a guy talks about his accomplishments, the average person will be like, oh, he's so cool, he's so sexy, he's so sexy and yeah. confident. But when a girl, she could say literally the exact same words, probably yeah. Yeah. like, oh, well, she's pretty full of herself. She do like an yeah. a, 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 a beta a test exactly i'm actually thinking of doing something like that that. it's been on my mind for a while to do a a little bit of experiment like this yeah so i feel like you know i'm such a big feminist and i and i promote uh positivity towards women so i was Mm. like let me proudly talk about my accomplishments because there is a difference between being proud Mm -hmm. and being cocky Mm -hmm. and i think women need to get better at learning what that line is Mm -hmm. cocky is i'm the best and no one's gonna be better than me Mm -hmm. and don't even talk to me about this because like i'll just destroy you at this right but talking about your accomplishments is you know what? I was named the top earning female on YouTube. I'm really, really proud of that because yeah. I worked really hard. Yeah, you earned it. It's nothing that the article online doesn't say. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I was like, we as women, especially financially, especially in terms of milestones, we just need to learn to own it because there's absolutely nothing wrong in being proud of things you've worked very hard for. For sure. And I think I can own it for myself, mm-hmm. but it's like, when those comments start coming in, when other people start treating you differently or judging you for it, like mm-hmm. how do we train those people to accept being proud of yourself? Well, I think it goes back to, first of all, we have to accept that not everyone is going to get it. Mm-hmm. Like I had to struggle with this for a while mm-hmm. online with comments. It's literally some comments are just people sitting there being like, how can I just disrupt whatever's happening? Yeah, You can't explain things to people that don't want to be explained to. Mm-hmm. And you can't get people to listen if they don't want to hear. You know what I mean? So, of course, I promote in all my content that, yeah, you should be proud and you should own your success, but am I going to try to convince other people in my comments that they should change their mind? Maybe if I'm in the mood to be sassy, but I know that's probably an argument I'm not going to win. So sometimes if I wanted to reply, I'd be like, well, hey, I'm really proud of myself and hope one day you can be proud of yourself too. Right. And right, that's right, it. right. What yeah. do you guys that's think? That's a great response, by mm-hmm. the way. That's wonderful. What do you guys, why do you guys think that guys can be super cocky and people love it but when women, or not, okay, not super cocky. Mm-hmm. Why can guys be super confident and people like it, whereas when girls do the same thing, people all of a sudden label her? What is that coming from? I mean, that's a really good question. I think there's a lot of deep-rooted issues as to why uh-huh. that is. I think it comes from the idea that right now, men and women, regardless of what anyone wants to say, they're not on an equal playing mm-hmm. field. Yeah. You know, there's still a lot more men in higher positions. And so there's just maybe there's not 
enough people used to women in those type of positions and used to women talking like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes back to, I have to just give a shout out to Nicki Minaj because mm -hmm. she actually has an entire video about this where she is someone who, a part of Young Money being surrounded by Drake and uh -huh. Lil Wayne, uh -huh. she talks about how Lil Wayne will walk into a studio and literally he will just be very assertive, very cutthroat and everyone will respect him. Okay. And she'll walk in and do the exact same thing and people, there'll be articles the next day about how she's so difficult to work with. Uh. And so I think it goes back to if there was more women in Nicki Minaj's position, maybe, that also were assertive and authoritative, then maybe we'd have less of that backlash. That's one mm -hmm. reason, but it also comes down to the idea of what people expect women to be. They expect them to be quiet mm -hmm. and obedient mm -hmm. and not have too much of an opinion and kind of just listen. Yeah, and I also think, like, if you look back in, like, uh, cavemen days, mm -hmm. right, the men went out and they hunted. Now, you brought back the biggest amount of food, right? Mm -hmm. You went out and killed and brought back the food. Like, you were the one that was like, oh, I want to attach myself to that person mm -hmm. because they're going to help me survive. Right. So I think men can come back with, like, look how big my... Mm -hmm. Piece of meat is. Yeah, right? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, like, my deer is or yeah. whatever. Um, and then as a woman back then, they would, you know, be Gatherers. home. Yeah, they uh -huh. would take care of the village. They would take care of the children. So I think women responded very well to the guys that brought home the biggest amount of beef. And mm -hmm. I guess in today's society, maybe that's the money version of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we just haven't caught up yet. Like what you were saying on the, um, it's still not an even playing field. We haven't gotten mm -hmm. there yet. But that's what I love about what you do and what you do and what we're doing here is that just bring more awareness to it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that we have to knock other men down, right? I don't think that's any of our intentions. Yeah, not at all. It's mm -hmm. just give us the same opportunities mm -hmm. and that same voice that men are allowed to have. Let's allow us to have that too. Mm -hmm. For sure. And feminism is, is never, I mean, regardless of what people on the internet want to say, mm -hmm. fem feminism is about equal opportunities. Right. It's not a man hating. It is not, oh, women should have this more than men. It is, hey, let's have equal opportunities nice. for both sexes. And that conversation involves both sexes as well. Yeah. And what you're saying is exactly correct. It's called evolutionary psychology, right. where because of cavemen days and because of how humanity has evolved, mm -hmm. there are certain traits men have and women have that is within us that we have to adapt right. because of the time and place we live in today. Yeah. Like, so because you are such a super boss, <laughs> as a female, do you find it hard to date guys who, like, don't get oh. it? Do they feel intimidated? I find it hard to date in general. <laughs> uh -huh. But I think, yeah, I, you know, I'll never forget the day. I don't remember who it was. I think it was a makeup artist I had for a random shoot once okay. upon a time, years and years ago. Uh -huh. She said something to me and I never forgot it because it actually bothered me so much. Okay. She said, you know, you're really confident mm. and I can assure you, you're going to have a really hard time ever finding a guy. Oh, she yeah. And I don't no. think she meant it in an offensive way. I think she meant it more mm. as like a warning. But even still, the fact that she said it, it never left me because sadly it has proven to be a little true it has it, it, you know there's been a lot of guys in my life that are really insecure about either like I can't talk about money with them mm -hmm. if, if mm -hmm. they don't make as much as me mm -hmm. I can't talk about career stuff with them as mm -hmm. much if they're not in the same place mm -hmm. um, and generally yeah because I am very outspoken and I have a strong opinion and I'm confident I often do find guys to be very shy around me Oh. or feel the need to be overbearing oh. around me. So it's, it's kind of one of two extremes, though. I really enjoy being around guys and just people in general who yeah. are very comfortable with who they are and very comfortable with who I am and just allow us to both be in our own space. Wow. So yeah. then how do you how do you find that right guy? Do you think it's going to be in entertainment or you think it's going to be random? I, you know what? When it happens, I'll let oh. you know, yeah. sister. As of right now, I haven't. And it's not, dating is not even something that's on my priority right. list right now. Right, Just because I'm so, so busy. But I, you know, I don't want to have that mentality also. I don't mm. want to move forward in my life thinking, well, every guy is going to be intimidated. That's not no. fair. No, 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 no. You can't generalize guys. You can't generalize girls. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm looking for someone who, the, the thing that's most attractive to me in any person is when they just know who they are and they're mm. real about that. And mm -hmm. other people don't impact that, you mm -hmm. know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you still have the cultural pressure um, even now that you're like super successful and you're like, hey, it's not my priority. Do you still find though that your parents are just like, so when are you going to find a guy to be married honest, kids? the greatest fruit of my success <laughs> has been the fact that I can answer that question with a no. 
Really? So growing up, I would be lying. Of course, my parents would be like, all right, when are you going to get married? Like, you got to get married. That's a very South Asian thing. Uh-huh. They, South Asians very much so believe in a timeline. Right. They very much uh-huh. so believe by this age you should be married and you should have kids. Or what will people think? Yeah. The random neighbors, uncles, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, what will yeah. they think? Yeah. What are they going to yes, tell them exactly. if they bump into them in the street? I'll never forget the day. You know, this was me being just a few years ago after the success of Superwoman, hitting certain milestones, subscribers, mm-hmm getting my parents to meet a lot of their favorite mm-hmm. actors and actresses as well. Moving to LA, the first person in my family to ever move out of the country for a career yeah. um, without it being marriage also. Right. Living alone without it being marriage. First right. person in my family. Right. Um, and my mom, I'll never forget the day she said to me when she came to my house in LA and she said the exact words, you know what, Lily? You're living life. Don't even get married if you don't want to get married. Just do whatever you want. I love that. And, um, so my mom is genuinely, and she's not just saying it. Like she's, uh-huh. I am... 28 years old. Yeah. I am an unmarried Indian woman. That is uh-huh. very blasphemic. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. But the fact that I have Superman and I have the career I have and I'm so happy doing it, my mom genuinely, it's not even about when I get married. She does not care if I get married because she knows my thoughts about marriage. I don't think it's a guarantee for people. I think people should do it if they feel it is correct. Mm-hmm. But it's not for everyone. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I think people, that's people's own journey, you know? Yeah. And so. Indian people growing up with this pressure of, oh, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Mm. I think that's incorrect. Yeah. So yeah. do you think it's purely, though, because you were successful? Oh, yeah, 100%. 100%. <laughs> well, because now she, she knows you can take care of yourself, whereas that's before exactly it was like finding is. a man or whoever to take exactly. care of you. It's yeah. financial safety. That's right? exactly what it is. Yeah. And I think you maybe your parents oh, yeah. are the same uh-huh. way. I think because your parents were born... Uh, in Vietnam. Okay, yeah. so I feel like most immigrant parents have this mentality, which is the one thing we want for our kids, it all comes down to, are they self-sustainable uh-huh. that's uh-huh. all it comes down to yeah. Yeah. so once it was like oh she's not like starving and dying and she knows how to pay a bill they were like okay we don't need to worry about uh-huh. this and most of the whole marriage thought with South Asian comes from I just want to stop having to take care of this person uh-huh. so that they can take care of themselves so yeah. your pressure came from the marriage side did you have any pressure about your career about needing to be a doctor or whatever like you know because yeah, I so, think a lot of Asian parents have the same thoughts <laughs> for about sure, that for sure for <laughs> sure a few years into my YouTube career my okay. dad still was convinced I was going to be a lawyer ah. still, so I'm really good at arguing so I get why he thinks I'd make a good lawyer yeah. but he was very keen on being like no like you should definitely go to law school and definitely that would be so good for you hmm. so even like a year two years three mm-hmm. years into it he was like but, hey, you could still go to law school. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, So, yeah, you yeah. know, I think it's been an interesting journey for them as well to see this very unconventional career mm-hmm. turn into something they never thought it could be. Mm-hmm. Um, but they def- there definitely was pressures to... No, they weren't thrilled when I said I wanted to do YouTube by any means. Yeah, and back then there was... N- no, like, case study to exactly. show them. Like, we were the case studies. Exactly. It was yeah. like, no, no, trust me. Yeah. Trust me. I know I'm not making money, and this makes no sense, and I have a beard on my face right now, but trust me. <laughs> trust me. This is good. I it's love like that. video gamers back in the day yeah. where it's like, you're wasting your time. You're you're a total loser if mm. you just sit at home mm, and play video right. games. Mm-hmm. Now they make millions of dollars. Exactly. So it's like that almost needing to introduce that new way of thinking Mm -hmm. to the parents but what do you do if let's say you're because I'm Greek and so I have the same kind of cultural Mm -hmm. issues and what do you do if you're not successful maybe you don't want to seek high Mm -hmm. fame but you want to get out from under your parents and you don't necessarily want to take that traditional path Mm -hmm. what advice to both of you Mm -hmm. would you give somebody that is trying to get out from under the wing of their parents you know I was I was going to say actually on that note is it's not just about saying, I want to make YouTube videos. And then my parents were like, oh, okay, we'll just wait for this to play out. They also saw me work so hard right. at making YouTube videos. Where my parents were like, wow, she's up earlier than ever before. Mm. She stays up later than ever before. She's in her room watching these videos, studying, writing scripts, learning all these skills, saving up to buy a camera. Mm-hmm, well, he's never mm-hmm. saved up to buy anything. Yeah. So they also mm-hmm. saw me treating it like a career. And so to, to anyone out there that's, trying to take an unconventional path, you need to know that it's going to take so much work because you don't have a boss. You don't have consequences for not meeting deadlines. Like, no one's going to get mad at Cassie or I if we don't upload a video. You know, YouTube's not going to call us being like, oh, you're an hour late on this upload. That's not a thing. (laughs) We get mad at ourselves. Exactly. (laughs) You have to be self-driven and be Mm -hmm. your own boss and work really, really hard. Whatever your passion is can become a career. 
if you are willing to treat it like it takes the work of three careers. Right. And you think having seen, because you've said in the past your story of where your mom saw you crying in your car, mm -hmm. do you think that that well, that's also... That's some proper stalking right there. I, <laughs> <laughs> I looked into you, girl. I looked into you. <laughs> Many videos I've nice. watched. Um, but do you think that that has something to do with it, where your parents or your mom saw, like, wow, she's she's very sad, she's very depressed, and now having seen, like, this light bulb or this fire in her, because they care about you so much, it's the fact that they saw you change. Do you think that that has something to do with it? I think that was a valid valid for them within the first maybe year or two. Okay. In the first year or two, like, they let me, after I graduated and got my psychology degree, they wanted me to obtain my master's. and. In the process of applying for school, I decided not to do that. So I asked mm -hmm. them to take a year off. Mm -hmm. I think a big reason why they let me take a year off and pursue YouTube was because they're like, okay, she is not in a great place. Mm -hmm. This is making her happy. Okay. Let's. They very much thought it was a phase. Mm -hmm. When I started to go somewhere and they started to see, oh, she's she's traveling, she's doing these shows, she's making money. I think the reason of oh well she's not sad anymore was less valid because they were like oh but she's also really creating a career out of this uh -huh. because even if you know something's making you happy parents are only going to allow that for so long right no they're not going to be like oh yeah do this thing for 10 years just don't be sad but it's okay if you're completely just useless and broke. <laughs> that's not going to fly for very long the happiness card only lives so long uh -huh. you know i think now more than ever and especially having coming back from kenya with my parents i think my mom particularly is very much so touched by the impact my videos and Superwoman has on other Aww. people. Hmm. So, you know, sending girls to school in Kenya, mm -hmm. my mom being a South Asian woman who came from a place like India who mm -hmm. inevitably faced a lot of sexism and mm -hmm. lack of opportunity, mm -hmm. she is seeing girls gaining confidence, gaining an education, right. gaining an opportunity because of what I'm doing. And I think that really, really pulls a string in her heart. Wow. Wow. And have you, in terms of like being a colored person mm -hmm. in entertainment, mm -hmm. me too, like, have you faced any type of racism or um, prejudice in a boardroom or whatever or mm -hmm. as you're negotiating deals? Anything yeah, weird? I, I'm lucky to say that I've never faced any really extreme cases of racism. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, coming from someone who is very good friends with a guy named Humble the Poet. That mm -hmm. is a bearded mm -hmm. person that wears a turban. Right. Like He probably has examples of racism that are very, very harsh compared to what I've gone through. Having said that, you know, they, of course there's been meetings I've been in where people, the CEOs of companies have been like, oh, so like, you probably have a lot of siblings. Your parents must be really strict. Wait, so how are you allowed to do YouTube? <laughs> oh, like, wait, so like, you don't have an accent at all. Those things have been said to me, yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I think maybe just my mentality of, I have this quote that is life is a comedy for those who think and a tragedy for those who feel. Uh -huh. And so I just take those things like, oh, okay, you're, you're, that's funny. But I'm not gonna let that really stop me in this conversation we're having in this meeting. Um, but I will say in terms of, Audience, yeah, sometimes. I mean, I get all the racist comments under my videos. Mm. I get all the sexist comments. Um, for me, the biggest hurdle with race was when I first started because I, of course, made videos, and I still make videos about my Indian parents. Uh -huh. I don't feel they're very culturally charged, though, because they speak English, yeah. and their themes are universal. Yeah. But when I first started, people in articles talking about me wouldn't even say my name. They would just be like, the Indian girl on YouTube. Really? That's yeah. how they refer to they you. They would just refer to, like, the Indian girl on YouTube or That's the brown weird. girl on YouTube. And I was oh, like, wow. well... I'm not just that. Like, I have a name. And I, it was this one article in particular that really irked me when okay. it was 50 creators. Each of them had a tagline. And uh -huh. so, like, some of them were really, really great. Like, Tyler Oakley's was great activist for, like, you know, yeah. gay rights. And someone else was, like, the hilarious girl next door. And mine was literally the voice of India. <laughs> I'm not even from <laughs> India, I should emphasize. I'm from Canada. <laughs> My parents are from India. But I was just oh. so, like, oh. So that's what they just think. I'm, like, just the diversity card in this article. Oh. And so that was a really big hurdle for me. Yeah. But I've learned to, if I'm really blunt, I've learned to use it to be my advantage right. when it's convenient. Right. And learn to not use it when it's not my advantage. And I think that is completely fine. How do you actually do that? Um, if somebody wants to include me in something because they want to be diverse, mm -hmm. I will do it. Knowing I'm there for the diversity. Mm. But then I will just kill it. I will make sure that when I leave that event, they don't just know me as the uh, Indian girl on YouTube. They're going right. to know my name. And even if I got in the door because of my skin color, I'm going right. to leave the door for other reasons. For I other love reasons. that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I love that so much. Yeah, it's <laughs> like the Steve Martin quote, be so good they can't ignore you. Exactly. I actually mentioned this during my uh, Stream is Acceptance speech. Uh -huh. And a lot of uh, articles are written about, you know, when I had that whole campaign with YouTube, that marketing campaign where I was on billboards. I was thrilled because my parent characters were on those billboards. Yeah, and I always, cool. I always commend YouTube for that because I, I say that's not easy. 
my mom character has a sh- scarf on her head. She looks super, super Indian. Yeah. And in a very, you know, controversial time in the world, that yeah. was a very brave thing for YouTube to do. Yeah. And I, in my acceptance speech, I said, shout outs to YouTube for being brave enough to put a brown girl on a billboard. Mm-hmm. And the reason I said that is because, you know, when I started YouTube in 2010, of course inside me, I was like, I want to make videos about racism and show people why racism is wrong. And making a video about why racism is wrong is not as impactful as being a successful person of color. Oh yep. God, in my opinion. Yep. You yep. know, I could have made those videos, they could have mm-hmm. got a few views, and it mm-hmm. would have changed nobody's mind probably. Mm-hmm. But then standing on that stage, accepting an award with my face on a billboard, being like, oh, shout outs for being brave enough to do this, yeah. I think speaks so much more volume. What do you think is your most favorite video that you've put out? Oh, so my favorite videos I've ever put out are the ones that make the little Lily that live inside uh-huh. me very proud. Uh-huh. I feel like one of the reasons I work so hard, and generally this is not BS, it's not for money, it's not for views, it's yeah. not for subscribers. I am drawn towards the things that the little version of Lily gets really excited about. So collaborating with my childhood idol, mm-hmm. Dwayne Johnson. Uh-huh. That's like, nothing is, that was, the, when I was born, that was the top of my bucket list. <laughs> Got it, okay. So doing that is like the top of my bucket list. Okay. Collaborating with Selena Gomez is another uh, one. Yeah. So all these people that I've really looked up to, those are always my favorite videos because mm-hmm. when I watch them, you have to see my face watching them. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. So there's such, such raw, genuine emotion in those videos yeah. that mean a lot to me. And how did those collaborations happen? Through different means. I mean, Dwayne definitely being the biggest one was because, and I genuinely mean I was obsessed with him Oh, I know. All my life. I, I can tell. Yeah, all yeah, my yeah. life. Before Let's YouTube understand was even this. created. Yeah. <laughs> I was obsessed. Um, and so when I started making YouTube videos, you know, as an older person, less obsessed but still a fan, I referenced him in a lot of my videos. Yeah. You know, I used to make jokes about him all the time. Yeah. Like, hey, we'll play rock, paper, scissors. I named my, my, changed my name to scissors if it meant the rock could slam me. I, all, <laughs> those jo- all the jokes happened, not realizing that his daughter watched my videos. Oh, and so, it's always the kid. Yes. It's and always so the kids, she yeah. introduced her dad to me. And when I met him, you know, long story short, he knew everything about me. <gasps> and he was just as much a fan, well, maybe not just as much because I'm a little bit crazy, but we were both fans of each other. And since he's become my mentor, so it's literally oh. my largest success story is someone who I idolized growing up. I can now text for advice, who is my mentor. And I mean, I can never complain about anything in life because of that fact solely. <laughs> Isn't that amazing that you kind of have something ingrained in you as a child, like a hope and a dream, and you don't know how you're going to get there, but you just keep working hard, you keep following your heart, and then somehow the universe puts an opportunity in front of you. But not to say that you're lucky, because you're not lucky, none of us are lucky. Hard work and opportunity aligned. I love that you said that. I love that you said Mm. that. Well, I have to say that because uh, a few months ago, for whatever reason, I was having like a, a really good week, like, mm-hmm. you know, lots of sales and all this kind of stuff right. and things happening. And then my dad literally just texts me out of nowhere and says, oh, you're lucky that you're successful. Like just out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it, it really hurt me. Yeah, but, I, um, that hurts yeah. me as well. Mm-hmm. When people mm-hmm. say lucky, lucky means you found something in a haystack or like, oh, you found a, f-. no, luck is, has nothing to do with people working hard. Mm. Wor- hard work gets you places, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. Of course, there's a cer- let me let me also explain that we are lucky in the sense that we were born in a place where we could have opportunities. Mm-hmm. We're born where we're mm-hmm. able to do these things with the capability to do them, of mm-hmm. course. But in terms of the hard work we put in, that's not luck. That's not luck. Yeah. Isn't it Oprah that says luck is when opportunity meets preparation? Exactly. Something I like love that. Yeah. Because so yes. if you're not prepared, an opportunity comes mm-hmm. by. You're exactly. not going to like. Yeah. One hundred percent. Um, yeah. But you speak about visualization. Mm-hmm. How important do you think that is? So, like, the people that are listening right now that really want to basically. In fact, they want to do a video with Lily Singh. And they put your poster on their wall and they go to bed every night dreaming about it. So visualizing it mm-hmm. can be a first step. What else do you think is like the big key to kind of then getting there? I really do believe in visualization. I feel because a lot of people have goals. But sometimes when people talk about their goals, they're super vague and they don't realize it. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. someone will be like, oh, my goals, I want to be really rich. What, what, does, that mean? what does that mean? What yeah. is rich? Is rich... A thousand dollars is right. a million dollars. Yeah. If you reach a million dollars, you're not going to be happy because it's not ten million dollars. Right. So I feel like the the key to visualization is being specific. Mm-hmm. What are the specific goals? So a specific goal would be I want to make a video with Lily. Okay. Okay. The next step I would say is that when I was you know starting out YouTube, I never had the specific goal of I want to make a video with Dwayne. Quite honestly, because I never thought it was an option. Mm-hmm. I didn't even think YouTube would last that long mm-hmm. for it to happen. I would say you need to go through a gang of opportunities before you probably hit the goal you want to reach. You know, even if every opportunity is not a video with me, you should probably take it. You should probably work hard. I'd probably say me meeting Dwayne wasn't just because I worked hard and then I met Dwayne. It's probably because I collaborated with 
10 other people before that. Mm -hmm. I went to 10 other events I was probably tired and didn't want to go to, but I went to anyways. Mm -hmm. And so just through the grapevine of working hard, I I got to that moment where I got to do that specific goal. But there's a lot of other things you got to do. You can't just say no to a whole bunch of things because they're hard to do because Mm -hmm. they don't specifically align with that one goal. I really do feel like hard work is 360 Mm -hmm. in in that regard. Let's talk about the state of social media right now yeah. because it's uh, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, I don't know. I just find myself getting really bored on Instagram. I don't mm-hmm. know about you, but mm-hmm. I feel like everyone's posting the same thing or everything's sponsored or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then uh, YouTube, we have certain interesting videos mm-hmm. that are going viral and mm-hmm. others not. Like, How do you feel about the state of the people putting out content right now? This is a struggle I've been having, and okay. I wouldn't be really just really genuinely honest here please I would be lying if I said it didn't immensely bother me you know this I texted Mm -hmm. you the other day being like I hate the state YouTube is in Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not even the oldest generation of creative you know there's the Jenna Marbles the Shane Dawson's um, the Smoshes exactly exactly. uh and something that has always really drawn me to YouTube is the fact that people without a production studio Without a record label, they can create. Mm-hmm. They create really relatable content that people enjoy because they're like, oh, there's someone just like me creating mm-hmm. this content. Mm-hmm. I personally, I mean, to each their own, I like content that is created, well thought out, mm-hmm. content that is positive. Mm-hmm. Emphasis on positive. Agree. I am not really interested in the challenges. Of, I don't have anything against them. I know there's an audience for them, and that's mm-hmm. great. What really bothers me is the negative con- mm-hmm. content. That's what it bothers me because YouTube is a place for young people. Mm-hmm. It is a place people go and make idols. You know, people call us their idols all mm-hmm. the time. And to know that a place where you can have the ability to create any type of content that will reach so many people around the world mm-hmm. and you are choosing to promote negativity to young kids that will be influenced by it mm-hmm. really bothers me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not naive. I know every person online doesn't care about positive mm-hmm. impact. Mm-hmm. That's just the fact of the matter. Right. Some people are online and being like, yo, this is a great paycheck. And I can't sit here and hate on that because everyone right. has different priorities. Yeah. Maybe if I was that young, I would have thought the same way. Oh, mm-hmm. this is a great paycheck. This is awesome. I should do this. Mm-hmm. But I think as a community and I think as YouTube as a platform, mm-hmm. we may need to make a collective decision about, okay, what do we want this platform to represent? Because recently it's been representing a very trashy, Mm -hmm. negative, disrespectful, irresponsible type of behavior. And I think that is problematic and it breaks my heart. My response to that is to not follow that trend. I am going to be honest, I'm sad to see a lot of my fellow creator friends trying to follow it. And that's only because it's hot right now. Exactly. But when something goes up really quick, it's going to go down really quick too. That's what I believe. Um, So the clickbaity kind of... That had well, its moment too. And yeah. now it's like parentheses not clickbait. <laughs> I would just yeah, I would I mean the fact that you have to write in a title not clickbait Ugh. is testament of fact enough that it's a problem. Yeah. I would just encourage all my fellow creators and anyone that's trying to make it on YouTube, I know it's so tempting to do everything to get the views. Mm. But if I can I just give you some business advice, like having a lot of views is not guarantee your career by mm-hmm. any means. Mm-hmm. You can walk into any meeting with any company you want to work with or any brand you want to work with or any other actor, actor, traditional person you want to work with. It's actually being good at what you do and having good content that's going to get you where you want to be. Not mm-hmm. You could have 20 million views. Mm-hmm. And if your stuff is negative, there's very few people that are going to want to work with you. And that's just being a good business person, mm-hmm. which I feel like I could sit down all these younger creators and be like, hey, I know you're probably having a really big paycheck and you have a fancy car and you probably have a lot of girlfriends. But in terms of a career, dude, this is probably not the best move long term. Yeah, and it's also, at the end of the day, we're all humans. We want to treat each other how you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And so if you're making content that's um, really just stirring up the drama in the community, Mm -hmm. like, I don't think anyone's going to want to collaborate with you. And, you know, I've been harassed online, Mm -hmm. and it's no fun to get death threats and lies made up about you. And then at the end of the day, you can't keep making that type of content. Maybe some people are going to be into it, but the people who are into it are united by hate and not mm-hmm. by love and that's just fleeting exactly and I think there's also something really dangerous about encouraging your audience to be so rebellious oh. and destructive mm-hmm. because I listen I'm not t- saying that if you're online you need to be a role model and act like a role model I mean to each their own you're allowed to be your own person but know that millions of young kids are going to be influenced right. by what and you do and you are a role model no matter whether you like it or not yeah. you are you have so influence. here's yeah. here's like a really just wild idea if you really need to be a jerk, don't vlog it. It's as simple as that. Like, if you really, it is your personality to be destructive and be a jerk and act a certain way, at the very least, don't vlog every second of it encouraging your audience to do the same. 
Hmm. You know, yeah. but they're tempted by the views. Of Same people it's like all that stuff. It's a trap. It's, it's the YouTube that. trap where you think the views <sighs> are the give all and tell all, but they are not. Views are like money. It's yeah. like you can't chase the money. You can't chase the views. Choose what makes you happy and let it chase you. You know what happens with views? And I'm guilty of this too, and I'm sure you are as yeah. well. Views is such a trap where you would be like, oh, my video's been out for a day. It only has two million views. <laughs> like you start saying ridiculous things like that. Yeah, yeah. It's like when I went and I, I, I visited uh, the rap one day a team the Toronto team for the NBA yeah. and I'll never forget the agent saying the story to me and I thought it was so ridiculous he's like okay you know NBA players fight all the time because there's a story of one NBA player that got 35 million and the guy next to him got 36 and he's wondering where the other million went yeah. and I remember standing there being like that's dumb but I do the exact same thing right like, it's been 24 hours and I have two million views and not three million views like <laughs> come on let's put things into perspective that's a lot of people either way do you think that's ego I think it has a big fact with how YouTube is structured. Mm. I think there's this desire to be on the trending page. Which I, nobody even knows how it works. Right. Nobody even understands the algorithm. So the fact that there's a trending page makes you want to believe in views. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing is that views is the main metric that's public that you see. Right. right? No one's success meter otherwise is public like no right. one's achievement list is underneath uh -huh. that video it's the only public stat and it's the easiest to under understand so mm -hmm. everyone chases it because you're like oh even if i have a hundred other cool things happening in my life that mean i'm successful mm -hmm. yeah. my audience only understands that number that's yeah. views and so you chase it and that's human nature but we need to be more woke <laughs> how do you how do you break free of that um i have a you know and i know our friend ro talks about this mm -hmm. a lot i have a 50 50 rule as well that Ro talks about, which is 50% of my content is things that I enjoy, but I know my audience is really, really gonna enjoy. Mm -hmm. It's not the most out of the box content, it's probably like series like my parents react and types of mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And then 50% of my content is things that I'm like, I don't care how many views this gets. I don't care if I it does well. Out. I just love this and I really want it. And a great a great example would be my Game of Thrones series. Oh, I loved that. So how did you awesome. do that? Very difficult to do, uh, yeah. very time consuming, very mm -hmm. expensive. Not a lot of views. Probably the lowest views of anything I've ever done. But you looked so cool. But I just had so much fun doing it. I was like, I love this. And so I think it's finding that balance of being like, hey, some things I get it. The views, you have a business. But other things, it's like, dude, I'm not just going to do things to get the views. I'm going to do things that excite me as a creator. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I am a creator. So do you think it starts from the purpose? So because your purpose is, I'm just mm -hmm. going to enjoy. And the same for mm -hmm. you. Like, if you enjoy something, are you then able to disconnect yourself a little more from the view count, the mm -hmm. business side of things? 100%. Because I think, you know, if I put something out and I enjoyed it, if it gets very little views, I still benefited because I enjoy it. Right. right. Whereas if you put something out and you're like, well, I don't even like doing this. I'm just putting on a facade, but I need to get a lot of views. The views are the only benefit you have. Right, so if the views aren't there, you're like, oh, well, now I need to really do something to get the views up because what, or otherwise, what's the point of doing this st trash I'm doing <laughs> anyways? So you start doing things to get views. It's, a, yeah. it's literally a trap. I have lots of friends that are in that trap where they're like, I don't know what else to do. This yeah. is my career now. Yeah. This is what I'm known for. This is what I got to do. You know? Wow. And do you ever find yourself, because there's always new people popping up on um, Instagram, on YouTube, mm -hmm. do you ever find yourself just straight up comparing yourself and like freaking out and then calming yourself down and then seeing another person and freaking out? Like, do you go through that? Recently, yes. Yeah. A lot of that. I think especially with the newer generation of yeah. YouTubers. I'm going to be the first to say, they're so funny, they're so creative, they're so innovative. They're better at editing than I could ever be. <laughs> it's like, you know, when a new generation of anyone comes up, they're like, yeah. oh my God, they're faster, they're stronger, they're smarter, I have white hairs, I don't know what's <laughs> happening. Um, and I had to really sit myself down and be like, hey, it's naive to think, you know, because I, I, I did have that year where I was like, oh, I am on the top of my game, uh -huh. I just won all these awards, yeah. I am like the top dollar, and I had that year, and then... It's naive to think that's going to happen every year. Right. Even if you look at traditional Hollywood, mm -hmm. you know, during um, Revenant, Leo mm -hmm. DiCaprio was the guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's not the guy every year. Yeah. You know, when you look at Jennifer Lawrence after Hunger Games, it's like Jennifer Lawrence is the A-list celebrity, top yeah. of the Forbes list. That's not every year. Yeah. You know, there's waves. It's impossible to think you're always going to be on the top. There's waves, and that's why you can't compare yourself to other people. Because not only are you comparing yourself, but you're mm -hmm. comparing that moment in time mm -hmm. that you're not going to be able to make eternal. You know, it's, it's about waves and supporting other people and understand that we each have our purpose and that's fine. Mm -hmm. And I really had to come to terms with that. Yeah, and that's something that I have to think about too and Sam walks me through and it mm -hmm. helps me understand. But it's true, like you can't be 
hot forever all exactly. the time. You just can't, but you can evolve. Exactly. And um, that's what I think is also very interesting, for example, with like Taylor Swift. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like she's been hot in our face for quite a long mm -hmm. time, but that's, if she had stayed country princess this mm -hmm. whole time, she wouldn't mm. be where she is now. She's evolved and people don't like it and mm. sometimes I haven't liked it too. Mm -hmm. But um, she's kept, she's been smart about that. Maybe I don't agree with some things that mm -hmm. she's done and I actually got a lot of hate for saying that, yeah. but that's its own thing. But the thing with being a YouTuber is you're always present. We're very touchable to mm -hmm. our fans, mm -hmm. right? But the things with like Jennifer Lawrence, um, Brad Pitt, like you release a movie, you're hot, but then you kind of mm -hmm. get to take a breath and step away and then come back even hotter. Right, right. We kind of don't get that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Do you exactly. feel that? I think that's why we're so prone to comparing ourselves. Yeah. You know, whereas a Jennifer Lawrence, I mean, I, I mean I'm not BFFs with her, but I yeah. can imagine that she's like, okay, I had my movies, taking a bit of time off. Yeah. I don't feel the need to be in headlines right now. There's no point huh. for me to be in headline right now. Right. Whereas we were like, but I release videos every Monday and Thursday. Right, right, right. <laughs> so I was right. like, I'm always on. I need to be trending all the time. Exactly. Yeah. So I think for me, what I, I exactly what you said, it's, it's getting better, not bitter. In terms of like mm, my YouTube. Getting that. better, not bitter. Yeah, it's That's good. That my YouTube videos are always going to be there. That doesn't mean every single one's got to trend. It yeah. doesn't mean every single one's got to be hot. That's my bread and butter, and that's my brand that's consistent. Mm -hmm. However, I will have that same mentality of traditional Hollywood where it's like, I was really, really hot when my book came out. Uh -huh. And now I'm okay with being like, I can take a step back. Right. The videos are still going to come out. Yeah. It's fine if I'm not in headlines for a second. It's fine if I'm not trending. But it, behind the scenes, I'm working on another project where yeah. I'm like, all right. And that's going to be the moment again to be like, I'm here again. But to have that expectation that you're always going to be in that intense spotlight is just naive and, and it, unhealthy. It's, it's super unrealistic, too. Exactly. And if you want to put out your best content, your best products, you have to give yourself mm -hmm. time to step back so that when you come back, you're coming hard. Hey, you're, can you, can you yeah. think of even one person? Any person in the world that's yeah. been hot all the time? No. No. It just doesn't exist. But we have the unrealistic expectation mm -hmm. of ourselves. Yeah, because, because we make it a reflection of like maybe I didn't work hard enough. Maybe well, something's wrong with me. And mm -hmm. we're getting the likes and views and comments mm -hmm. on the daily. Exactly. So we mm -hmm. are forced into a position where we are constantly being judged by our numbers, mm -hmm. which is so unhealthy. Exactly. Um, yeah, no, I, I talked to some creators and noticed like, you know, you, you see when creators are on their high mm -hmm. and then they're kind of like, going a little bit yeah. down and you can see that a lot of people get they seem depressed yeah. they seem like kind of lost mm -hmm. and that is sad because they were all about the views and exactly. all about the subscribers and now have to find like you know reach back to why did you start this channel to begin with exactly. and i and i think for people who started back when we started mm -hmm. before the monetization before the fame maybe that's a little bit easier to dig deep into but mm -hmm. for someone who started seeing the money and the fame mm -hmm. like where's that foundation anymore exactly it's yeah. It's a different environment. It's a different climate. Yeah. And I think it also doesn't make it easier that, you no know, Jennifer Lawrence sitting at her house on a break doesn't have to deal with 100 comments being like, you're irrelevant. Do you even make <laughs> videos still? Like, I think the most hurtful thing someone said to me recently, and I will admit it bothered me, they were like, you're so irrelevant. And I was what? like, hmm. what? <laughs> it, like, hurt my ego so hard. I was like, I'm ready to, like, sit down and be like, are you irrelevant? And I was like, listen, no. Yeah, okay. I didn't win every award this year. Who cares? And my videos aren't trending. All Who cares? Yeah. If I'm sitting here with 12.5 million subscribers and millions of views and being feeling irrelevant, then that's a problem with me. Yeah. That's something I need to check because yeah. I can't be that easily bruised. Like, come on. Yeah. And you have to do that self-talk, right? All the time, yeah. Because otherwise it can seep in. You start to believe mm -hmm. it. And you start to let it bring you down. And Sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like, you know what, to be in blunt, sometimes right. I feel like we need to sit back as creators sometimes and just give ourselves a reality check. No, we, you know we should have a session. Exactly. And just actually complain and be exactly. like, you're being weird. Yeah, exactly. Where <laughs> you're literally just like, yo, what are we complaining about right, right. now? Our lives are awesome. I know. Literally, yeah, it's a lot of hard work and sometimes you get side Of course, there's a lot of hardships. But at yeah. the end of the day, like, I am so grateful for the career I have yeah. because I know if I was doing something with that psychology degree that I do not enjoy in a job that I hate, I would just be so unhappy. Yeah. And at least now I can say, yeah, it's really tough and I don't sleep. I freaking love what I do, though, yeah. so it's fine. I love that. And yeah. I can see the passion in your eyes, your mm -hmm. body, your soul. Thank and you. uh, yeah. and I'm just so happy to have met you. You say, I'm happy to have met you, too. Cassie's awesome. Aww, Those of you that are thanks. listening, you're like, oh, she's just a voice. Or, like, I just, like, do sit-ups with her. <laughs> she's actually, first of all, she's poised. She has great posture. Aww. If you're watching this, you know this <laughs> She's such a just, she's so good at being an adult. Oh, Like, your wow. adult goals. Thank you. Your adult really? goals. Yeah. What? Actually, really awesome. have you ever gone to the wrong airport or gone to the airport one day late? 
No. Okay, so that's not very adult of me. No, but it? still. I was, like, I was like, I was trying to make the connection. No, 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 yeah, no. no. Was coming. She's that's coming. what I do. It's but bad. Still, you're yeah. just so poised. You're so sweet. You're Aww. so kind. You're so self-aware as well. I think out of mm. everyone I've met, there's various times where you've either texted me or come up to me and said, hey, like this thing you mentioned, like I am bad at that or I have this problem. Mm. People don't really say that. You are so self-aware with your strengths and weaknesses of which you have way more strengths. But you're no. Just so, no, you are. You touch your toes really? all the time. Oh. Yeah, it's like a thing. Um, but yeah, you're just so self-aware. And I, I think that's why we get along very well because I, I enjoy that you're self-aware. Yeah, and I appreciate your candid, candid post too. And um, I just had to text you after you... I forgot, was it that you... Some bought, Forbes a, bought a car or, or yeah, a something Forbes, good, yeah. yeah, something like that. Yeah, and then I was... Um, doing a uh, a deal with Mercedes mm-hmm. AMG and my Which congrats audience, by the way when I saw that online I was like <laughs> <laughs> thank you but here's the thing I almost turned them down mm-hmm. because I said I don't think my audience would be into it mm-hmm. how weird would it be for blogilates who's like you know fans uh, probably aren't even driving cars right mm-hmm. now like to do this and they're like no 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 like we like that you're a female entrepreneur mm-hmm. you know what you want you're high performing so this is a high performance car like we really want you yeah. and so I was super hesitant but we ended up doing it and um, what I had to do with my post instead of just me in a car looking all fancy like yeah. look at my new red mm-hmm. I explained the story of earning this mm-hmm. car and being able to reach your dream because you worked hard for it. And I think people understand better when mm-hmm. it comes from a, a non-douchey way and yeah. more like a I've earned this type of way. So mm-hmm. thank you to you for putting up that post because I really was starting to feel like my fans are going to hate me for this. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to feel like I didn't deserve it. I'm showing off. I'm being cocky because mm-hmm. as a girl growing up and being the leader of the group or being mm. the one who raised my hand all the time, I was called cocky and mm. arrogant. And I don't like that, but yeah. I I kept doing it so I didn't mm. have that many friends. Yeah. Till now. <laughs> well, look how things have changed. <laughs> but isn't it interesting that you yeah. surround yourself with people that are who very... Like you. Who yeah. are as driven so yeah. that they don't perceive it as being cocky. They actually perceive it as being hard work. Right. Yeah. You know, right. a, an adult woman who is, like, mm-hmm. owning her stuff. It all comes down to you got to surround yourself with people who bring out the best in you. Yes. Not people that want to label you or judge you or Ugh. whatever it is. It's, it's about... Dude, I want to be around people where I look at them and I'm like, I need to work hard. Uh-huh. And they recognize I'm working hard. Uh-huh. We have ambitions. That's We talk about ideas, not people. Yeah. Yes. Need to around those people. Yeah. yeah. When we started this podcast, actually, we were like going back and forth so many times. And I was like, there are very few people that make me sweat. Mm-hmm. She makes me sweat. And that's great. And I love it. Yeah, exactly. Oh my God, I love it. Because it, it lights that fire, right? Mm-hmm. It's like adding fuel to the fire you already have burning. Right. And I think it's so important to find those people around you mm-hmm. that energize you and don't make you feel bad, but mm-hmm. actually like help motivate right. you. I think that's really good to pay attention to. A lot yeah. of times people are like, well, how do I know who to be around? Pay attention to how you feel mm-hmm. when you're around people. Yeah. If you feel tired and unmotivated yeah. that's probably because of the people you're around mm-hmm. you know there's some people you're a great example a lot of our other creator mm-hmm. friends you know Lindsay Rowe Justine mm-hmm. all of them they're all great examples when you are done spending time with certain people you go home and you're like oh I need to like do yeah. something right yeah. now yeah. you need to be around those people yeah yeah you know, yeah the natural human energy drinks of the world <laughs> oh I love that <laughs> take a little drink of exactly, rum exactly, a little drink exactly, of lily exactly. <laughs> so what do you do with the people that don't energize you you know this is tough because in the real world, sometimes yeah. those people are not our choice. Right. Sometimes mm. those people are our families. Mm-hmm. Right. Sometimes yep. those people are our parents. Sometimes those people are our siblings. Um, I always say that choosing to surround yourself with people that make you happy and feel good is not being rude. It is being in love with yourself. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's good to be selfish. You should surround yourself with people that make you feel good. doesn't mm-hmm. mean you got to be rude and cut them off. It's just, right. you know, you choose to mm-hmm. be around people that make you feel good. Mm-hmm. But what do you do when those people are in your house and right. live with you? And it's tough. And, I, you know, for a lot of my life growing up, I used to feel like my parents didn't understand me, didn't mm-hmm. relate to me. I used to feel that way. Um, you got to do what's in your control. You know, if if your parents don't understand, try to make them understand. And if they really, really don't, Surround yourself with friends that understand. Mm -hmm. And surround yourself with a physical environment that pleases you. I always say, dude, you know what Mm -hmm. makes me really happy? Colorful post-its on my desk. (laughs) Make a physical Mm -hmm. environment around you. So whatever you can control, focus on that. You can't always control everything. But what you can control, focus on that. Yeah. All right, and let's talk about girl love. Yes, let's talk about girl (laughs) love. Let's talk about girl love because this is what this is happening right now. Yes, yes, the girl love here. Girl love is, you know, I started Girl Love. It's a social good campaign, and I started it about two to three years ago. It is actually the result of a failure. It was, I write about it in my book. Um, It was me trying to do a collaboration, 
and it falling through. Okay. And the, that collaboration idea was the Girl Love Challenge. Uh-huh. And so when it fell through, I was devastated, and I was like, oh, my God, I really love this idea. Um, and then I just thought, hey, I'm going to do it anyways by huh. myself. So I reached out to... Wait, I didn't realize it fell through. Yeah, it fell through because what you know of Girl Love is this video with 15 creators in it. Uh We're all talking about Girl Love. Uh So, correct, that's the first time the world ever saw Girl Love and it's a collaboration with 15 people. But before that, months before that, there was this very big collaboration with celebrity that shall not be named. Okay. Because it's not their fault. Okay. But it was very excited to shoot with this this uh, female celebrity and it fell through. Oh. And so because it fell through, I was so, so heartbroken. Okay. And the idea for that video was the Girl Love Challenge. Got and so it, it never happened. But then I just molded it into something else and did it anyways with, oh. with 15 other girls. And in my world, it was like, okay, that one-off video, that was it. Girl Love, that, okay, cool, done. But then I just so fell in love with this idea of women supporting other women. Yeah. And I was like, let, let me do something else with this. So yeah, yeah. Girl Love started out as a campaign to end the cycle of girl on girl hate, which mm-hmm. is something that's very prevalent in our mm-hmm. communities, yeah. um, and encourage women to empower other women. Mm-hmm. But I do have to say, over the past couple of years, having the opportunity to work with so many organizations and travel to so many places around the world where girls just simply don't have great lives, it has evolved into not only ending the cycle of girl on girl hate, but women coming together to really combat a lot of these issues women face around the world. Because mm-hmm. um, girl on girl hate, if you look at the greater scope of things, it should not be an issue. Right. Like, there's girls that don't go to school, that aren't allowed to go to school. Mm-hmm. How are we sitting here in privileged North America being like, girl on girl hate is a... No, we need to get rid of that. Girls, need to, girls and guys need to come together and yeah. really focus on issues that are negatively impacting women around mm-hmm. the world. I mean... I've, I've been to India recently, I've been to Kenya recently, and there's just some, I've talked to girls and that are 14 that literally look me in the eye and tell me about the sexual harassment they encounter on the oh, weekly yeah. from their dads and their oh. brothers and how sh- this girl really wants to go to school, but you know why she can't? Because her parents say no. Because wow. the girl shouldn't go to school. Why oh. does a girl need to go to school? You're just going to get married anyways. You know, when you're sitting there and listening to these stories, you're like, how can we as humans sit anywhere in the world, even with our privilege, and think that's okay. Mm-hmm. It's really not. And so I, I made a post about this recently, and the way we should think about Girl Love or any of these issues is that we can celebrate our successes, as we just discussed. It's mm-hmm. great to celebrate your success. But you should never be so cocky with your success because at the end of the day, we're all part of this team called humanity. Mm-hmm. And as, for as long as there's other people in the world su- suffering so severely, mm-hmm. you can never actually feel like, Oh, I'm on top of the world and I'm the best. How can you when your brothers and sisters around the world are starving and not going to school? Yeah. You know what I mean? If you cuz real success is helping those people. Yeah. So, I think that's how everyone should think is that listen, we should all go to sleep at the night no, at night knowing that we had a good day, but we need to help people that can't help themselves also. Okay, so how can everyone help out the organization? Yeah, yeah. so so Girl Love, you know, I, I have partnered with We many times. Um this Girl Love Rafiki I'm wearing right now for those of you that are hearing and can't see this it's right there it's a really cool like <laughs> it's light a, blue and gold yeah. bracelet so basically it's the story of these rafikis is they are handmade by mothers in kenya uh-huh which does two things uh, they're tangled on me one is that it gives the mothers employment so this beating has been in their culture in the maasai culture for a long time mm. but they never got paid to do it yeah. so we've gone in and now they get employed to pay to make these rafikis which then get sold so they have an income now but also the sales of the rafikis help them send their daughters to school. Oh, wow. So I love that. last year for my birthday, I released this Rafiki, and we sent 600 girls to primary school <gasps> with the sales. Wow. And Amazing. this year for my birthday, I have a Rafiki version 2.0. So I just came back from Kenya. I designed a second one. Yeah. And we're going to try to send even more girls to school. Yes. So you can buy a Rafiki, but I, I also want to say that, you know, the best way you can help is just to be a good global citizen. Mm. Sometimes you can't always donate. Mm. Sometimes you don't have the means to do that. But it goes back to simple things. Just being grateful for things you do have, Mm -hmm. you know, not encouraging sexist, racist, homophobic behavior around you Mm -hmm. always helps. If you can't give money, you can at least give care Mm -hmm. every single day for free. You know, being nice costs nothing. (laughs) Seriously. Exactly. Seriously. But we'll also put the link in our on the video and podcast. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Do it for Lily's birthday. Yes. (laughs) And I will say, you know, as someone who's been there, I know sometimes there's a lot of people that are skeptical about these things, but I literally 
flew there. Lily was just met there. The moms, oh. yeah, made it with the moms, met the girls that yeah. went to the school, went to school. So like I've been there firsthand and met those girls and see the impact that it makes. And so this is with my own eyes, not through the grapevine. <laughs> oh, you are a real live superwoman. Oh, thank you. As are you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And as, as are, are you. <laughs> um, okay, what is one superpower that you think um, you can share with the fans that they can ignite within themselves? One superpower that they can bring out in themselves? Mm -hmm. huh. I'm going to say that consider uncomfort and failure currency in, in the purchase of being successful. Ooh. So I'm going to say that if you want to be successful, being uncomfortable and failing are the best coins you can have. Because <laughs> nice. that was the only way to learn those experiences. So get out there, fail two, three, four, five times because yeah. there's no way you're going to get to success without those two, three, four, five times. You have so to. get out there and just do it. And if it's scary and uncomfortable, good, it should be. I love that. That's awesome. Okay, so we always end the podcast by saying be heroic. So yes. here we go. You guys, thank you so much for watching and don't forget, be heroic! Bye. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This was Yay. so much fun. That was Amazing. so good.